Turner Home Entertainment presents a dialogue, a conversation with Carl Sagan and Ted Turner. Carl Sagan is one of the greatest minds on this planet. He's an accomplished scientist who has played a leading role in the Mariner, Viking, and Voyager expeditions to other planets. His research has enhanced our understanding of numerous aspects of the heavens. And he's brought his work to a general audience through such books as the Pulitzer Prize winning Dragons of Eden and his Emmy and Peabody award winning series on television Cosmos. In addition, he has taken a strong stand in defense of this planet and its people by working with his colleagues on research into the long term effects of nuclear war and the destruction of our environment. And he's made us aware of the tremendous dangers facing us if we don't do something to halt the arms race. I'm grateful that he's here to share some of his knowledge with us. Carl, pleasure to have you here this evening. Ted, thank you. We're destroying the ozone layer. We're heating up the earth. We're destroying our forests. We're poisoning the groundwater with radioactive wastes and pesticides. How do we ever get in this mess, and is there any way out? <laughs> well, <laughs> How's that for a start? That's a, that's a good question. Well, we got into the mess by uh, by not paying attention and by business as usual. Uh, humans have been on this planet for something like a million years. And for the vast bulk of that time, things changed extremely slowly. The population increased very slowly. Our technology increased, improved, but by very slow steps. And just recently, you know, this is what's called an exponential. It's flat for a long time, and then boom! you suddenly get a huge increase. Increase in population, increase in technology, increase in pollution, increase in our powers to disturb the environment, to change the planetary environment. But we're the same old human beings uh, as, as we were a thousand years ago and a hundred thousand years ago. Um, not much has changed with us. And so it's very hard for us to catch on that, uh, that there's a new situation and we have to adapt to it. On the other hand, that's one thing we humans are good at, uh, adapting, figuring out. Uh, um, we're smart. That's our principal advantage over all the other species. I mean, we're not faster, stronger, better diggers. We don't fly all by ourselves. Uh, what we do is figure out and build because of our, our hands. And so uh, I think there's uh, certainly a chance of getting out of this mess, but not by business as usual, not by the idea that uh, that we shouldn't plan ahead, not by the idea that anybody can do whatever the hell they want and uh, it doesn't uh, affect the environment. There has to be a new way of looking at the world. A lot of those uh, uh, issues that you, that you raised are global issues. For example, uh, global warming, the greenhouse effect. Uh, you put gases like carbon dioxide or CFCs, other greenhouse gases, into the atmosphere over this country, they don't stay over that country. The, those molecules don't have passports. They don't know about national sovereignty. That's something they never heard of. The atmospheric circulation spreads those gases all over the planet. And so what one country does affects all the other countries. The solution to these kinds of problems has to be that everybody on Earth works together. The industrialized nations have the biggest responsibility because they're, they're the biggest polluters. The United States puts more CO2 in the atmosphere than any other nation. But uh, Western Europe and the Soviet Union and Japan and even the developing countries all make significant contributions. So there has to be a new way of looking at the future, and that is that we're all humans, members of the same species, on one fragile little planet. We're all in this together, and we have to work together. Uh, that's kind of the silver lining of these crises. They are forcing us to become a planetary species. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting, and, and, and I certainly, certainly agree with that. I know another problem that, uh, that we're certainly all, all aware of is the, is the bloated uh, arsenals of, uh, of nuclear, nuclear weapons. Uh, we've had a tremendous uh, thawing in relations between the, the two superpowers. We have a, uh, the, the Soviets are going to be meeting with the Chinese. We have a, seem to have a, a real move away from a war here on the planet and a, a move towards, uh, towards peace. Do you, do you think we can get rid of these nuclear arsenals and, and how do we go about doing it? Well, you got to ask what they're for. I mean, presumably, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union really intends to uh, to blow up the planet, to, you know, destroy the global civilization. That's not what they're about. The uh, professed function of the nuclear weapons on each side is to prevent 
the other side, from using their nuclear weapons. If that's all it is, then we've got to ask, how many nuclear weapons do you need to do that? Uh, so, uh, for example, you could ask, how many cities are there on the planet Earth? Let's say a city has 100,000 people or more. You probably don't need more weapons than what's required to destroy every city on Earth. There's only 2,300 cities. So the United States, by that criterion, only needs 2,300 nuclear weapons. Well, we've got more than 25,000, more than 10 times enough to destroy every city. But not all those cities are our enemies, either. No, no, no I mean, we're including our own cities. But the Soviets say they're not our enemies, either. I mean, I don't, I don't know who, who has enemies so bad that they, they're, they're willing to even think about dropping nuclear weapons on them. That's right. And, and you have to really hate somebody to do that. Well, and it's suicidal. <laughs> I mean, it's stupid even if you hate somebody. If they have nuclear weapons and you attack them, they're going to attack you. And, uh, and so the thing is immensely stupid. If we were only concerned about deterrence, that's the magic word, to deter the other side from using their nuclear weapons, then all you need is a tiny fraction of the present bloated, grotesque, and ruinous, uh, including ruinous in cost, uh, arsenals. Uh, a minimum deterrence that is absolutely safe, that is an invulnerable retaliatory capability, could be done for a thousand nuclear weapons or a few hundred nuclear weapons. So, you see, what's happened recently is there's been this much ballyhooed uh, INF uh, treaty, uh, Intermediate uh, Range Nuclear Forces, which uh, is terrific. I'm all for it. It lowers the arsenals by about 3%, and the nuclear warheads are being recycled. They're not even being gotten rid of. What we have to do is make vast, massive cuts in the arsenals on both sides. And nothing short of that is going to make us safe. Well, do you, how, do you, do you think that, uh, that, that, that there's the political will uh, here in the United States? The Soviets say, tell me, I'm sure they've told you, they're willing to uh, get rid of them, get rid of them uh, on a, over a reasonable uh, time frame because we don't uh, see any confrontations anymore. Do you think that uh, this administration has the political will to, uh, to join in with that? Hard to tell. I mean, it, certainly the new factor, the stunning change in the world situation, is the accession of Mikhail Gorbachev to, uh, to power in the Soviet Union. So it's not just that they're willing to have uh, an INF agreement with, uh, with intrusive inspection, American inspectors on Soviet soil, uh, but they're willing to have much more than that. They've made they made unilateral cuts in their uh, conventional forces. For a year and a half, they made a unilateral uh, moratorium on nuclear weapons testing, inviting the United States to, to respond, to join, to reciprocate. And so far, nothing.